Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the wonderful privilege of looking together into this wonderful Bible, this wonderful Word of God, where there is so much to learn, and it is so valuable, the Bible, which was written by God uh, for you and for me, so that we might know more about ourselves but way more also about Holy God, who is the creator of the universe and who is bringing this universe to an end very soon now. Oh, my, next year is very close at hand, and, and uh, that is when it's all going to end. We have learned that by very, very careful searching of the Word of God, knowing that God has put that that information in the Bible, and it, 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 we're living in the day when we have been able to find out what that information is, and now we can share it with others, we can talk about it together, we can look at these verses, and so on. But this is your program, we want to hear from you, so shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to ask a question regarding Genesis chapter 6, please. Genesis chapter 6, yes. What verse? I don't, I'm don't. i actually in my car, so I don't have my Bible in front of me, but it talks about the sons of God coming down and seeing the daughters of men. Yeah, two, curious. the son, verse 2. Or let's start with verse 1 to pick up the context. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them, or as, they took them wives of all which they chose. And Jehovah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, what is your question? Who, who are those sons of God? When they're we, not, pe they're well, not people of the earth, or they're from... Well, somewhere. when we search the Bible, remember the Bible is its own dictionary, it's its own... Uh, uh, it, it, we, we, lear we learn our answers from the Bible, and what happens when we become a child of God? We read in Romans 8 that we're adopted into the family of God. We become sons of God. And uh, uh, there were already true believers in the days of Noah. And so, and what does God warn in the New Testament? He says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And here we have an illustration of what happens when the true believers become unequally yoked. That is, they marry unbelievers, which are called daughters of men here, and then wickedness multiplies. It would like to think, well, if the true believer marry the unbeliever, the next thing you know, the unbeliever would also become a true believer. Uh, no, normally it doesn't work that way. It is. It means that that family is going to start going further away from God. And that's exactly what happened so that wickedness multiplied on the earth. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kimber. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, sh incidentally, there are many theologians of the past who have said the sons of God were angels, and that is absolutely a, 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 a wrong idea. The angels are a different creation than, man, than mankind. They are, they are not created in the image of God. They are ministering spirits that God made. They are a different kind of a creation. God created everything after its kind, and you don't find an intermarriage between an elephant and a rabbit or a butterfly with a bee. Uh, each thing is of its own. Uh, 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 there's intermarriage between the same kind. So mankind marries mankind, and angels, the Bible says, do not marry or are given in marriage. So that whole 
idea that had been spawned and has been held by a great many churches and theologians uh, was uh, a product of very, very poor study of the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good afternoon, Brother Kempkin. You go ahead with your question. Yeah, um, I'd like to turn to Acts 13, verse 14. Acts 13, verse 14. And 42 to 44. Let's look. Acts 13, verse 14, and 42 to 44. Acts 13, verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. Oh. I'm sorry? Hello? That, that's Acts 13, verse 14. Is that the verse yes. you wanted? Yeah. And then 42 is... Uh, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath or the coming Sabbath. Uh, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, and that actually is a word that is a uh, uh, is uh, should be translated and the between Sabbath that came the one that is the Sabbath that is between the two uh, Jewish Sabbaths came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, what is your question? With, with, with Sabbath, are they talking about the first day of Sabbath or the, or the seventh day of Sabbath? Because it was after Christ was crucified. Well, now, the way we are to understand this, it's quite simple. Uh, G, uh, Paul, first of all, uh, was ministering to the Jews, and they, of course, kept the seventh-day Sabbath. And in order to minister to them, he, uh, he had been a Pharisee, and so he had access into their synagogues, and, and he... Uh, taught them there in their synagogues on the seventh day Sabbath. It's also but, said about the Gentile when um, well, excuse the Gentiles me. asked Paul to repeat the well, sermon now, in verse 44. Well, excuse that's me. Not, that's what those were the Jews. Excuse me, I'll get to that. You know, but the Gentiles in this city, they had no interest in a seventh day Sabbath. That's a Jewish uh, tradition so far as they were concerned. They wanted also to hear from Paul. And the, remember that God, uh, at the t time that Jesus rose from the grave, had instituted a first-day Sabbath. As it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, that Sunday morning became the first of a new era of Sabbath. And so that is when the New Testament church began to fellowship together. They did not come together on the seventh day Sabbath that followed the Jewish uh, situation, but they came together on the first day of the week, and so it was on that day that was, and that was the day in between the seventh day Sabbath, uh, and on that day uh, there Paul ministered to the Gentiles, and so there's no uh, difficulty in understanding this language. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Sure. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Go ahead with your call. Yes, uh, Harold. Um, do you believe First John chapter 2, verses 20 and 27, where it talks about the anointing, that that applies to everyone? All Christians. Uh, let's look at let's look at the language. First John, chapter two, verse twenty. Uh, and twenty-seven. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. 
Now, uh, this is speaking to every child of God. We have an unction, that is, we have a an anointing, uh, and the Holy One is God Himself, and uh, and we know all things that God wants us to know. It's not saying that now we become super smart and know everything that's ever happened in the world. Of course not. But we know the things that pertain to what God wants us to know about salvation. We know we're sinners. We know that uh, Christ is the Savior. We know that uh, uh, the Bible is the Word of God. And we have intense des- an intense desire to serve God uh, or to uh, be obedient to everything in the Bible. These are the kind of things that we know. Okay, what I'm trying to get at is if you have two men, two preachers, two Bible teachers, who say they're being taught by the Holy Spirit and they're both sincere, and they come to a different conclusion concerning a doctrine, does that mean that one of them is not being taught by the Holy Spirit or he's not being receptive to the teaching, or both of them could possibly not being taught by the Holy Spirit, and they're both wrong. Would you agree with that? Well, first of all, just because the preacher says he has an anointing of the Holy Spirit, that does not mean he has. All kinds of preachers and Bible teachers are convinced they're children of God, and they're not at all. They are following a do-it-yourself salvation plan, and yet because of these kind of verses... And because they like to come with the authority of the whole Bible or the authority of God on their side, they will make a strong case for the idea that they have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, right. when we when a person teaches, uh, it we can have an anointing of the Holy Spirit, or, or let me put it this way. The moment we're a child of God, we have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean that everything we try to teach is exactly accurate or correct. Because remember, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for correction and for training in righteousness. And the first one that's going to be corrected is a as a child of God who is trying, who is teaching and wanting to be as accurate as possible. So he might one day teach something that is not accurate. That does not mean that he as an individual does not have an anointing of the Holy Spirit, but it just means that uh, God has not opened his eyes to that particular truth. Correct. Uh, and uh, But that doesn't mean that tomorrow he won't have that right. accurately. Yeah. Do you think that James' warning in James 3, 1, where he says, Let not many of you become teachers, brethren, knowing that as such we shall incur a stricter judgment, should be a verse that every pastor, Bible teacher, should tremble when they read it, because (laughs) it's a very serious matter when we teach something. It absolutely is, and I wish we could impress that on everybody's mind, but that's not our business. Our business is to make sure that is impressed on my mind, that is, each one of us who uh, uh, want to teach someone, uh, we want to be as accurate and careful as possible in what we are teaching. Uh, In fact, I find in my own life I have to pray every day, Oh, Lord! Uh, teach, uh, help me that I'll never be saying thus saith the Lord when the Lord has not said and if I did make a, an incorrect uh, uh, a teaching that is I decided on that the Bible has said thus and so and if I find a day later or a week later or a month later or a year later I was incorrect my my I don't hesitate for a second to say I was mistaken because, uh, uh, first of all, I know no teacher is going to be accurate 100% of the time. Otherwise, Correct. God would not say uh, that the Scripture is given for correction. And But we all have to walk very humbly, and uh, and pride can never get in the way. That's the, 
that's the that's the real problem. Correct. You yeah. know, we I'm a teacher and I know and uh, and you just listen to me and uh, then uh, that means that I uh, my pride would suffer greatly if I had admitted that last week I was teaching you something incorrectly or last month and I can't admit that so I'm just going to stay away from that subject. Uh, that is horrible, but unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I, I got to admit that in the 70 years I was a, a, a very a much in the heartbeat of the local congregations, and I attended a, a couple of worship services virtually every single Sunday during that whole period of time. I don't think I ever heard a preacher say, and I've heard many, many different preachers, I've ne I don't think I ever heard one say, you know, I was mistaken. I want to correct something that I was teaching last month or whatever. And that's a very sad situation. Right, uh, Harold, and that's the reason why every believer, it's their responsibility to study the Scriptures daily and to be able to get the discernment from the Holy Spirit to determine whether a Bible teacher is correctly teaching well, that's, that's, Scripture. That's a very big statement. Every every listener is not necessarily qualified. Uh, uh, they uh, they can be a true child of God and and truly want to be obedient to the Word of God, but they just don't have the mental capacity to search these things out or to check on their pastor. And uh, that's why, uh, that's why uh, during the church age, God very carefully uh, uh, set up elders and deacons and, and gave qualifications so that there could be some uh, correction going on right in amongst those who are uh, the spiritual overseers of the congregation. And in our day, when everyone is uh, on his own, so to speak, because we don't have any religious organizations now that people become a part of where it's, it's between that individual and God yeah we, we have to try our best to listen uh, uh, and uh, uh, and maybe many times it's too complex to discover whether it's true or not but whenever we are able to check it out we want to be we surely want to do that yeah, thank well, you. we should all be diligent in studying the Bible, as uh, Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved, yeah. a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank we you for all calling. all strive for that. Yeah, thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Yes, Matthew 24, verse 36. Matthew... 24, verse 36, Matthew 24, verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no one, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, what is your question? Now, this is the verse that's almost always brought up by callers when they challenge uh, uh, family radio's uh, uh, sighting of a, of a specific date for Christ's return. What I find very frustrating is that uh, almost always the callers will misquote this verse, and, uh, and even though you're very careful with uh, Scripture, I've, I, I don't hear you correcting it. Now, you had a caller yesterday who used this verse to challenge you, and the caller said, but of that day and hour, uh, no man, in other words, no man shall know uh, that day or hour. Now, that's a misquote. Uh, the, the verse does not read, no man, uh, no, no man shall know. And I've often heard you say, uh, no man can know. The verse doesn't say that. The verse is in the present tense. I think this is a significant uh, distinction. Because if we're to say that it doesn't really matter, or it pretty much means this, uh, the same, that the present tense could could infer the future tense, then we can make the argument that no man, uh, that, that anyone who says that they're seeking God or that they're saved cannot be true, because the Bible states in Romans 3.11, uh, there are none that seek after God. Uh, so I think it's an important distinction uh, to make, and I'm wondering why. 
uh, you well, don't first of it. all, first of all, I, I, if we didn't have this verse, we have a verse like First Thessalonians chapter five, where it says, uh, "You know that Christ is coming as a thief in the night," which is essentially saying, uh, "No man can know, no man uh, shall know, no matter, no matter what kind of what kind of verbs you want to place there." The fact is. Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And uh, that is true uh, for those who are not listening to the whole Bible. And so uh, it's not a matter of... of uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an apt admonition, sure, certainly, to look at that verse itself very carefully. But on the other hand, if you, if you didn't have that verse, you could find two others that would... Uh, uh, would uh, uh, indicate uh, very closely what the what the caller is trying to get to, and the, the uh, that is the issue. What are they trying to get to? Not the, because there are many verses that speak to this, and when we look at a verse like like uh, when we look at a verse like First Thessalonians, chapter five, where God says in in uh, uh, and this is this is uh, echoing what these callers are trying to say is uh, in verse two: For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. That summarizes all those verses, and we have to get right to that question. Now, wait a minute. Just uh, uh, let's take the uh, let's not debate about the whether it's present tense or future tense. Let's let's look at the big issue. Do, can we know at any time the time of Christ's return, or can we not? That's really the issue. But if a caller is is misquoting, if a caller is viewing uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six in the future tense, if the caller is seeing that verse as saying that God is saying no man shall know, then they're resting on the belief that God is making it clear that this is a terminal condition that man uh, is not capable of knowing. Well, but if the, but, excuse but, me, but if the verse is looked at in the present tense, uh, 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 then it states that this is a present condition of man, that man in his present condition does not know in the same way that man in his present condition will not seek after God, but the Bible also shows that God can change that condition, and I think that's a distinction that should be pointed out to the callers. I think the verse well, thank, should be quoted properly. Thank you. Thank you for suggesting this, but the fact is that the big issue we we ha we have to face the big issue and uh, because you can go if you, if if you try to explain this uh, verse in detail you still haven't solved the problem of first thessalonians chapter 5 where it says that god for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night and that's what they're driving at that we can't know. We can't know. And so let's get right to the big issue. And uh, because if they, if we can, we can discuss uh, exactly verb tenses and so on of, of Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But that doesn't solve the issue. That solves that one verse. But it doesn't get to the issue. And that's a, a very, very important issue an exceedingly important issue and so i want to get right to the uh to the 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 big issue not particularly uh, making sure that we under that we have understood that verse perfectly but thank you for your for your idea i appreciate it and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum yeah mr Campion, you're both wrong in that verse matthew 24:36 is in the perfect active indicative tense um, if you want to know what that means you can go to blue letter bible online and see for yourself but uh, my my point is um, if you could read acts chapter 1 verse 3 well all right let's read acts chapter 1 verse 3 to whom also he showed himself alive after his passing by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of god Hello? Uh, now, what did you want to do with that? Well, you have a new tract out that you sent me. It's God gives another infallible proof. 
Now, to use that phrase, infallible proof, the word infallible means incapable of error. You only have ten verses. You have seven pages on this track. You have ten verses, and the rest of it's just man chatter. Now, that's pretty outrageous to put infallible well, proof when the whole thing is contingent on the calendar. And the calendar is dead wrong because there was 430 years from the promise of aid to Abraham until the giving of the Lord, according to Galatians 3.17. I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The evidence we have that is infallible, that, can, that came from the Bible, is not uh, subject to any errors in the calendar. Uh, the calendar has been changed from time to time uh, throughout history, even in the last couple of thousand years. It's been changed from time to time. But it is when we coordinate everything to our present modern calendar. And that can be done uh, because it's, we have a, exactly the number of days that are in a year, not based on any calendar, but based on... Uh, on the scientific evidence of astronomy that, that, the, that every year is 365.2422 days in length. And so we can go back uh, uh, 10,000 years and know exactly uh, what, uh, uh, if, our, if, uh, if our calendar would have gone back that far, we would know exactly what date on the calendar a particular day was back 10,000 years ago because it is uh, uh, that is absolutely trustworthy. God uh, 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 set, set in motion the great celestial clock already in Acts chap er, Genesis chapter 1 and so we are not subject to the calendars not a bit. The uh, calendars uh, don't enter into the equation at all. It's only that we have to coordinate so we can talk about it so we can have a relationship between the different parts of the Bible. And so we have to have some kind of a standard. And the standard that has been adopted is our modern calendar. But thank you for calling and sharing. And we're ready to uh, take, a, take a break right now. We're continuing with the, we are continuing with the open forum. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Brother Ken, it's a pleasure to speak with you. I wanted to ask you uh, two questions. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a visual artist. I like doing oil paintings and watercolors. Uh, excuse and, uh, me. And the past uh, couple uh, of years, ex- I've had a trend uh, in just a lot. Uh, excuse me. Would you be kind enough to turn your radio off? That will make our, co- our, our conversation easier. Please do that and then go back to what you were saying. Yes, I'm a visual artist. And uh, my artwork has taken a change in the past. I've been starting to do some biblical type of artwork. Now, I know uh, we're not to be uh, worshiping graven images and statues and things like that of the Lord. So um, from the picture I get from what I've been hearing on family radio, should, should I discard that? Well, you, you, you're on, a, in, on uh, as you are sensing, and that's why you're asking the question, you're on very, very sensitive soil. Because the Bible says don't make any kind of an image that would be a, 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 a painting, would be a two-dimensional image, a, a statute would be a three-dimensional image, but don't make any kind of an image of anything that is in heaven or that has to do with holy things. Like you don't want to make an image of an angel. You don't even know what they look like. And uh, uh, true, you can you can uh, make a painting of and say this uh, this is Moses. Uh, you're, uh, I, I don't think there would be anything wrong about that. But but uh, the moment that you're, uh, you'd never want to make an image of the baby Jesus or G- or uh, 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 Jesus in the manger or something of that nature or of uh, any kind of heavenly beings. You, uh, so you want to really stay away from that altogether. Okay, now also, um, I'm in a marriage. It's been kind of on some rocky ground through years, and me and my wife, we've been getting along better recently. Now, she's got four other children, 
by two different men. And, you know, I'm trying to take the approach that, that Jesus would have given and try to give her the forgiveness because let no man put asunder what God has joined together. Now, do you think I'm taking the right approach on that? Even if she does have children by different men? Well, the fact is... You are married to this lady. She is your wife. Whatever her background is in the past, that's that. That's uh, you are married to her. You ta you have her now as she is. Whether your marriage was uh, uh, a proper marriage or not is beside the issue. You are married, and you are to love her to pieces. You are to remember that. Uh, 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 Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And you are to uh, think how you can make uh, make her happy. Uh, always, of course, with a direction of, of trying to get her interested in the Word of God if she isn't really at this point. And you're going to be praying and praying and praying for her. But at the same time, you are going to use every means possible uh, to... Uh, to show your love for her. And that's because you are married to her. It's not a question uh, that you love her because she cooks well or that she's a fine bed partner or anything of the nature or she dresses nicely. Uh, uh, you love her because she is now your wife. And and uh, uh, that, that is now a testing program in your life. Can you follow through the way God wants you to? But thank well, I certainly, I certainly am glad to hear that. I'm going to keep the trend going. You have a good night, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Go ahead with your I, call. Yes, I have a question on uh, Revelation 2, 15. Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. And there we read, So hast thou also them, he's speaking to the church of the of Pergamos, and he says, And so hast thou also that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. Now, what is your question? I just was wondering, what is that doctrine of, of the Nicolaitans? Oh, we don't know. We All we know is, is that it is something that is contrary to the law of God, contrary okay. to the Bible, and it's false teaching. And, okay. And so, uh, it, uh, uh, Nicholas, incidentally, there was a man named Nicholas, as I remember, who was one of the seven... Uh, first deacons that came into the church well I don't know I'm speaking from memory and I better not follow up on that it's not important anyway but the fact is he was uh, it, it sounds like he was a ge uh, Gentile he was not a Jew but that's beside the issue too the fact is he came into the church with doctrines that were contrary to the word of God and people were following that and the church overseers did not stop it they were allowing it to continue and so God is warning them you're on your way to be a dead church okay and and the, the seven spirits of God uh, on chapter 4 uh, 5 well, the seven, you know, the number seven is the number of, of perfection. And the seven spirits of God is representing the, whole, the Holy Spirit in every aspect of his being. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is eternal God. And uh, we don't understand eternal God. We don't understand uh, uh, the perfection of the Spirit of God. We All we know is, is that this is language that is speaking about God and we believe it with all our heart but we don't understand it we accept that we know that God is perfect in every aspect of his being okay that's good 
Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. I have uh, just a few questions. And uh, my first question is about Judges, Chapter 6, yeah. 36, yeah. 38. Judges, Chapter 6, verse 36 to 38. Judges 6. Verse 36 to 38. And it's talking about when Gideon was a judge, and Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. God has come to Gideon, who was a farmer boy, and said, Look, I want you uh, to go fight with the Midianites uh, who were really oppressing Israel tremendously badly at that time. And uh, here Gideon is just... Uh, uh, a farmer, and and uh, so Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth, on all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morning and thrust the fleece together and wrung the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water and then he uh, in the next verse he uh, reversed the question well now uh, suppose that uh, uh, suppose that the the it is the uh, uh, let it now be dry only upon the fleece and upon all the ground let there be dew and that also turned out exactly the way uh, Gideon had asked about. Now, what is your question? Uh, so my question is that, uh, from my understanding, uh, Gideon here is asking God for a sign, and here he's asking uh, with the, the wool fleece. And so what I want to ask you is that I've asked God to show me a lot of things, um, and lately, actually not lately, but for three years, I've been seeing this same time over and over and over again. And that time is 11-11. And I would see that number, like, at least once or twice a week. And uh, just recently, I've been seeing it many, many, many times a day. And, uh, All right, now let me explain something. Here is Gideon. He did not have the Word of God. He did not have the Bible. He was a farmer boy. And God comes to him and speaks to him, uh, and, uh, and he believes that this is God speaking to him, but uh, he has n uh, no, nothing else uh, uh, to uh, lean back on insofar as how God works or how he acts or whatever. And so he asked for a sign. It's at a time when God is still writing the Bible. And, in, and you notice here that what did happen, the sign and all, that it's all written in the Bible for us to read. But now we have the whole Bible. We never, never, never should ask God for a sign. Because when we do that, what we're saying is, Oh, Lord, we want something more than what you have given us in the Bible. And God declares in Revelation 22, verse 18, If we add to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add to you the plagues written herein. That sign is effectively like we're saying, God, speak to me uh, apart from the Bible. I want something more. And whatever we should do is never ask God for a sign. We can, we can, we have the Bible to read. We have something that is just, just infinitely more wonderful than Gideon had. He did not have that at all. And uh, and we, uh, more than that, uh, we uh, and we can, we know we can pray God to direct us into the Word of God. 
uh, to show us from the Word how we should go. We can plead with God for that, and maybe God will do that, or maybe He won't do it. That's up to God. But to, sh- to look for a sign uh, in some way, no, we must not do that. Oh, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't mean to carry on this same topic, but uh, I'm a really strong believer of what the Word says, and I completely agree with everything you just said. But the reason why I'm asking you is because I believe that you could answer this question because I've gone to many people and everyone couldn't give me a right answer. And it's because I've even been getting dreams, and I'm not making this up, but I'm getting dreams of even seeing that number in my dream. And well, now, you, s- you see, you got to remember, there is an enemy out there who has the ability to have supernatural action with human beings. We see that in tarot cards and in Ouija boards and in mediums and mediums and uh, seances that they have. Satan is very actively breaking the silence between the supernatural and the natural. And when we ask for a sign, and God is not going to give us a sign. He's given us the Word of God. Uh, And if we ask for a sign, that's a wide open opportunity for Satan uh, to uh, come in with some supernatural activity uh, to show us something that will draw us uh, away from the Bible and looking at uh, at that sign. And that's why we don't want to ever ask for a sign. You're, you are, <laughs> you are, you, you don't realize it, realize it, but you're setting yourself up to uh, allow Satan to trouble you. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's another question I have. Yes. And I'm not sure if this is the correct term. Uh, sleep paralysis there's many times when I would awake from a very strange dream and my whole body was paralyzed and it was to the point where I couldn't even speak but I noticed I I was very very scared at that moment I, I, I have no idea what is going on in your life but you can depend upon it you don't want to pay any attention uh, for spiritual understanding when you are having something that involves a dream or a vision or a voice or anything of that nature. Our bodies are very complicated. We have a, we have a, a subconscious mind that gets into it, we, uh, and all of that can... Uh, be t- uh, some of that can be taken pl- place in different ways that, that we don't even understand. But if you're going to uh, look for a relationship with God, stick with the Bible. And don't yes. pay any attention to that kind of activity. Okay. Uh, I just want to uh, further clarify, because I believe this is a very important topic. Um, but I just want to explain uh, one of my short dreams to you and maybe you no excuse me I don't want to hear any one of your dreams I because that is something going on in your subconscious and uh, and it has nothing to do with the Bible and it has it's not anything at all that we want to look at at all I'm sorry and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. Good. Uh, you you kind of sparked my curiosity a couple callers back, um, and I have a Bible verse that I would like you to explain to us. Um, you stated, and I've heard it before, uh, that you should love your wife as God loved the church. Well, didn't, since we're supposed to come out of the church, didn't God, in fact, kind of divorce himself from the church? Well, when God is talking in Ephesians, let, let's read Ephesians five. Let's, okay. Let's. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> it's time now where we have to look at the the source itself. In yeah. Ephesians chapter five, we read 
uh, 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 wives, submit yourself. I'm reading verse 22 of Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ. Now, the church here, God is not talking about just uh, the uh, congregation. He's talking about those who are the true believers within the congregation because they are the ones that are really subject to Christ. They are the ones that God has in view. Every member of the church uh, is, that is not a saved person is still in rebellion against God and and can't really match this, uh, fit into this kind of language. But the, when it says Christ is the head of the church, he's head of all the true believers. And they are the ones, uh, uh, and, and, and they are the ones of whom he is the Savior, for whom he is the faith Savior. Therefore, so as the church is subject to, excuse me, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Now, the church uh, here he's talking about here are the true believers. And how much did he love us? So much that he took every dirty, lousy, rotten sin that we've ever, would ever commit in our life and took it upon himself and was found guilty. And God killed him and buried him uh, uh, as a penalty for uh, the, the sin that we should have endured. That's how much he has loved us. And so we can't, we can't outdo the, uh, that kind of love. We, he, we, he loved us not because we were nice, lovely people. He loved us when we were dirty, rotten sinners, and, 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 and he took upon himself our sins in, making, uh, in order to be our Savior. And so... When it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. You see that there? That's talking about the fact that he made payment for their sins. That means we can't do enough for our wives, that we really are very, very concerned for their uh, their happiness. We're not going to do anything uh unlawful that is contrary to the word of God to make them happy no but there's a whole wide uh, gamut of things we can do that are not contrary in any way to the law of God and yet can really show our wives and there we husbands have to recognize uh, that most wives are far more uh, dependent upon us than we like to believe. They are looking to us for support and for guidance, but they quickly turn away from that when they find our interest is only in what what we husbands are interested in. And my, that's a trap that we all can easily fall into. Uh, a Bible verse, uh, John 3 verse 16, please, and I'll take the answer off the air, and thank you very much, sir. John three sixteen. For God yes, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, and will only believe on him if Christ has saved us, because before he has saved us, we can't believe on him, because that's a good work that we do. And we're never, never, never to think that we have made a contribution toward our salvation by some kind of a good work we have done. But God is saying that whosoever believeth on him, that is, whosoever has become saved because he has saved them, and as a result of that, they believe on him, they shall not perish. That is, they are certain to end up in the new heaven and the new earth and uh, not be subject to uh, to death. Uh, that is, if they die in their soul existence, they're not going to die. They're simply going to change residency temporarily and await the resurrection of their glorified spiritual bodies on the last day so that they can end up throughout eternity future as co 
heirs, co-owners of the new heaven and the new earth with the Lord Jesus and uh, reigning with him forevermore in the future. You know what? There, there's, I believe there's a spark of God in every human being that's on this planet. Now, is it, I don't know if it's possible for every human being on this planet to believe in God. Like, you know, I don't know, say the atheists or something, they don't believe that. But, you know, the, the... I was brought up, you know, to believe in God and since I was a little, little child, you know. So, you know, who knows? I mean, I don't know if I'm saved. Yeah, and well, am, excuse me. You know, let, let me explain something. In one sense, you have a, a little tiny bit of truth. We Mankind, and that means every human being was created originally. Uh, we're all from the loins of Adam and Eve, and they were created in the image, in the likeness of God. We don't even understand that, but that was something fantastic. Fantastic that mankind, and that includes every human being, was created in the image and likeness of God. But because we came from Adam, uh, when he sinned, all of us uh, sinned, and we became spiritually dead. We no longer had uh, life, uh, the life of Christ within us. We became dead. Uh, so that when uh, when uh, uh, it showed up in the fact that we continue to sin. It shows up in the fact that finally we physically die and we're dead. We're dead forevermore. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the, body, the wages of sin is death. Unless, unless God makes arrangement to make, to take the rap, <laughs> to use a figure of speech, uh, to take the punishment that we deserve for our sin, uh, and that is what he has done for those that he saved. He, before he ever created the world, already, he, he was laden with the sins, all of my dirty, rotten sins that I would ever commit, and uh, every dirty, rotten sin of every human that he eventually did save. And so the law of God was perfectly satisfied on our behalf that the wages of sin is death. Christ uh, became our substitute. and But he did not become the substitute for everybody in the human race, only for those that he, uh, that he came to save. And, uh, and that is why, that is why eventually uh, uh, we end up with him forevermore in uh, the new heaven and the new earth because he made the full payment. But that full payment has nothing to do with the uh, with the vast multitude of people who uh, live out their life on this earth. They 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 can think God's thoughts after them to some degree. They they because they were created in the image of God, but they. But they're a long ways away from becoming right with God, and the law of God uh, actually uh, mean, uh, calls for their death. The wages of sin is death, and they will all end up dead, forever dead, never have conscious existence again, and uh, uh, and then finally the whole universe, including all of their them, their dust, their bodies, whatever they, whatever they are, will all be completely annihilated. Okay. But thank you for calling, and we have time for one more question, I believe. Shall we? Or oh, well, we have another half hour. I forgot. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The earthquake that's to take place on May 21st, 2011, is that an earthquake that is, is it rumbling in the earth right now? Will it, will it start on the morning of May 21st? Or can you give a little uh, explanation I, on that? I have no idea. The Bible does not give us any clues that there will be, uh, Preliminary activity. There could very well be, 
but but God doesn't require that because God is the creator of the earth, and He can bring a, he, he can take the most the continent with its most solid rock with no cracks in it at all, and split it wide open in a split second where He doesn't need preliminary activity. On the other hand, uh, maybe there will be some preliminary activity, but if it, because uh, this earth has always been subject to all kinds of earthquakes ever since God cursed it right after Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, therefore, how can we distinguish? Is this preliminary to the final end, or is this just going on the way it always has been? So we just forget about that. But let's pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take the next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, um... You know, you had a couple of callers uh, talking about uh, Matthew twenty four thirty six, and uh, just want to mention for the benefit of the uh, uh, <clears throat> listeners that thirty six it says, but about that day and that hour, no one has known. Uh, it's in the uh, present perfect tense, and so up to that point. Uh, you know, the uh, no one has known, and that that would be uh, in agreement with uh, Daniel 12:9, when uh, you know after the seal is open, then you know people, the believer believers, could know, and so, and uh, uh, this is uh, based on uh, J.P. Green's uh, literal, you know, translation as well as. Young's trans, uh, literal translation, you know, has uh, this, no one has known. And so I, I think that's uh, important. You know, when they say no one knows, then, you know, it's present, and it could be interpreted as could be future as well. But when it says no one has known... Well, uh, it, 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 it also agrees perfectly with what we read in Acts chapter 1, verse verse uh, 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 7 where he says it is talking to the uh, those who were beginning the church age uh, uh, which would go on for 1955 years to the year 1988 uh, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father has put in his own power there, there, it is it's very clear there are many passages that indicate that there will be that time when nobody will know but that is not saying that nobody can know finally finally uh, because we have other passages uh, that we have alluded to from time to time that show very clearly like uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 5 that there the, the time will come when we, when the true believers' hearts will know time and judgment. But the real issue is that here we have a third of the earth's population. Let's just sort of look at, 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 at where all of this finally settles on. A third of the world have, according to the Almanac, and it uh, it's a reasonably uh, uh, correct. It doesn't have to be absolutely correct, but that means uh, at least two billion people in the world presently have an identification with some kind of a church that focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and God is saying that those churches will not know time or judgment. Uh, that is, they, they, Christ, for that will come as a thief in the night for them. They do not know the day or the hour. But he's also insisting in Matthew 26 and this Matthew 24, and this is characteristic of, of the teaching about concerning Christ or concerning God. But the Father knows, God knows, God knows, and uh, therefore Christ knows, the Holy Spirit knows, uh, we can't we can't think for a moment that they do not have that kind of knowledge, and so, but the but the fact is that those who 
are believing that he's coming as a thief in the night are in terrible danger because First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5 says that they, in chapter 5 verse uh, uh, 3 or 4, First Thessalonians chapter 5, we read that sudden destruction is going to come upon these dear people. And that is what we are really concerned about because we, then we learn, yeah, they, he, Christ comes as a thief in the night because they are still in the nighttime of, of belief. They are not saved. And, uh, but f- there are others for whom Christ will come because they are, they know when Christ will come because they are children of the light. And that's where we want to get our focus. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's just that, uh, shows your inter- interpretation is, you know, uh, completely agrees with the, uh, rest of the scripture. And so, anyways, I just wanted to bring, uh, bring that, uh, point up. But also, you know, Dr. White, when you had the uh, uh, debate, you know, he was saying, oh, you're the only one that comes up with these, you know, crazy interpretations or whatever. And uh, I know in uh, Revelation 20, uh, verse 10, and uh, there uh, also J.P. Green, as well as Young, uh, Young's literal translation, says, and they were tormented day and night, to the ages of the ages. So, anyway, so you're not the only one that, uh, you know, uh, has that uh, interpretation. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you, sir? How are you, sir? Yeah, turn, turn your radio Excuse me. Excuse me. Please turn your radio off. We're getting an echo that we can't live with. Please turn your radio off. Maybe that'll help. Okay, how are you today? How are you today? We still have an echo. If we can't uh, get rid of that, we'll have to go to our next caller. I'm sorry. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello. I have two verses for you, please, and then a question. Uh, The first verse is Ezekiel 37, verse 1, please. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. Yes, please. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. There we read, The hand of Jehovah was upon me. This is Ezekiel's experience. And carried me out in the spirit of Jehovah and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Thank you. And then uh, Jeremiah 8, verse 1. Jeremiah 8, verse 1. Jeremiah 8, verse 1. There we read. Eight, verse 1. And at that time, saith Jehovah, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves and spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung, that is for manure, upon the face of the earth. Now, what is your question? I was wondering if you think the bones there represent the same thing in those two passages. Well, the uh, in, 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 there are two different uh, passages here. They interrelate in that. In Ezekiel 37, we do read, for example, that that God can cause bones to hear the word of the God, of of the Lord. We read in in verse four, prophesy upon these bones and saying to them, "O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord." And uh, so God is in, uh, indicating that bones can hear 
uh, and obeyed the word of the Lord. However, the intent of of uh, Jeremiah is that it's talking about the bones that are that are uh, risen out of the graves because they are laying out there like manure on the ground, uh, being a shame in the eyes of God. Uh, uh, and it's only those bones of unbelievers. Whereas in Ezekiel 37, as we look at uh, the full message here, God is also indicating that these bones represent our the fact that before we are saved, he's talking about those who will become saved, we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead. And when God calls us uh, to eternal life, uh, like bones can be ra- raised so we are raised from our spiritual death into spiritual life so the intent of Ezekiel 37 uh, is much uh, 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 there are similarities and yet there are many differences than in Jeremiah chapter 8 okay. but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Campion. Um, I have two questions. Uh, uh, number uh, first, the first um, question is that um, if Christ um, looked at the sin that the church uh, was committing and then um, decided to employ Satan. Um, who is fighting us so we we will not be able to follow oh, oh, his commandments and then he he abandoned us because the church sinned against him and then employed Satan to come to take over the church then why should husbands still continue to uh, uh, cling on to their wife because that is the significance of or the exemplary life that Christ wants wants us to live on the face of the earth. Well, As, now, excuse uh, me. Now, excuse me. We're not talking about... We're, God is not saying now that... Uh, well, first of all, in Ephesians 5, remember when I talked about the church, it talked about the true believers, not about the congregation, not about that Roman Catholic congregation or that Baptist congregation or that uh, Methodist congregation, because it has both wheat and tares in it. It's talking about the individuals who are true believers, and they never, never uh, separate from an intense uh, relationship with the Lord Jesus. Uh, and when God is talking about how he has uh, abandoned the church, he's finished with it, he's not finished with the eternal church. Today he is adding to that left and right. There are a great many people becoming saved today and are part of the church, the eternal church. But, uh, and that is, the, uh, that is the picture of Christ's relationship with the true believers. Uh, whether they're found in a local congregation or in our day, whether they're found all together outside of a local congregation. He's not talking about uh, the congregations. They, that, they, the congregations, they are the ones that come under the wrath of God and, and are ruled over by Satan. The God, uh, Satan is not, we're not, the true believers are not worshiping Satan. No way, no way. That's why they ha- have been driven out of the churches, so that they won't be worshiping Satan. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I uh, have a question about the, the timeline on the end. Um, I, I started listening to your radio station about, uh, I don't know, four months ago, and at first it was... I, I, I was blown away with what you're saying, and I believed everything, and then I went into a little bit of doubt, but as I worked the Word, I couldn't find any uh, inaccuracies with what you were saying, which is really kind of, um, it shook up my, my foundations of what I was taught, and one of them was about the end times with the Antichrist, the, um, like there's supposed to be a rapture, then the seven-year period, um, and then the three and a half for the anti is, you know, is the Antichrist on the earth, or has he already come, or I'm, what do you know about that? You see, the problem is that 
until right in these last few years, theologians, however serious, diligent, holy, brilliant, whatever, uh, no matter how they studied the Bible to try to understand these kind of things, they could not come up with the right answers because it was not time for them to come up with the right answers. So, for example, and I still remember when I was much younger, uh, we, and, and we would talk about the Antichrist. I still remember I was wondering for a, f- a few years there, maybe the Antichrist is already born somewhere. Maybe he is growing up someplace because I bought the same idea that maybe the Antichrist is some kind of a human being that is indwelt by Satan and is a great going to be a great religious leader as well as maybe a great political reader. Who knows? But then, uh, right as we went on, finally God showed us who the Antichrist is and showed us conclusively from the Bible that the Antichrist is Satan. He was already in existence. Uh, he's talked about in First John of the Bible, when, and that was written about 2,000 years ago. And God spoke then about the Antichrist, and he is the one who is to come. He also speaks about the Antichrist coming near the end. So no human being could possibly uh, fit that specification, that description. So immediately that threw out all the uh, the speculations of the theologians uh, that had gone on before. But when we uh, then we realized, but Satan, oh my, he fits perfectly as the Antichrist, as the pseudo Christ. Look how he's presented. In Second Corinthians 11, he comes as an angel of light and as ministers of righteousness. He is someone that uh, ruled the world uh, for the first 11,000 years of its existence until he was cast out of heaven at the time Christ went to the cross. And uh, he has harassed the church for the last 2,000 years, and now finally he has been employed, officially employed by Christ to rule the churches and to be worshipped in the churches. And that is where they talk. That is what God is talking about, the coming of the Antichrist, uh, so that he rules not only in the churches, but also over the whole world. We read it, for example, in Revelation 13, Verse 7, uh, it's talking about that beast that comes out of the sea. That's another figure pointing to Satan as the Antichrist. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. In other words, the saints were all thrown out of the churches. Uh, the, the Bible uses the language of Revelation 11 that they have been killed, that is, they've been silenced, and they can't. Uh, speak in the churches anymore to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him, or him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, anyone who's not a true believer will automatically worship Satan because he thinks he's worshiping God by whatever religion he's following, or he thinks he's worshiping Christ, or he thinks he's worshiping the Holy Spirit. But in fact, he is worshiping the Antichrist, Satan. In five years, that made sense to me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, um, I have two questions. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your question. Yes, you can hear me, right? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, my um, question is that, um, first question is that the church, um, all churches are, are being inhabited by Satan now, right? God has left, Spirit has left all churches, even Pentecostal churches. Yes, there are no but, exceptions. Of, but the reason why I ask that, is because I last I used to be a member of this church um 
I was a member of a Pentecostal church where I used to live. Um, and I joined there in December of 2006. And I stayed there until February of last year. An incident had happened in that church where one of the um, men in there, I guess, deacons or ministers, had, uh, I was, I was struggling with a certain, I was backsliding and I was struggling with a certain issue. I thought at the time that I could talk to someone about and his comments sort of offended me. He made me feel like I was, you know, like a, a wrong person, even though I know I was wrong for the things I was doing, but I was trying to, I needed someone to talk to. To make a long story short, I left the church and since for a year now, since that was last year, February of last, oh nine, last year, I have not been in a church and yeah. my, um, uh, you know, sinful natures have gotten worse. Yeah, but you know, let me I've make excuse. Out, excuse you know. me, may I please interrupt here? There, I want to make a point here. We do not leave the churches. The basic reason for leaving the churches is not because we have been offended by something, or because we don't like our particular co- church that we've been going to, or we don't like the leadership of it, or whatever. That's not really the basis, because. We might, uh, then, then it might only be our church, but there may be other churches someplace that are still faithful. The reason we leave the churches is because God commands us to leave the churches. Hey, because God is telling us what is happening in all the churches. Whether we've been offended by them or, or, or not offended by them, whether we, they still appear to have a very fine preacher, God-fearing preacher or not, we are commanded to leave the church. This was already given, for example, in the Old Testament, in in, uh, no, in uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 51, in verse 45, God commands, My people, go ye out of the midst of her. Now, he's speaking about Babylon because the churches ha- well, are now being ruled by by Satan, who was typified by the king of Babylon. And so God speaks of the churches, all the churches, no exception, as Babylon. Go out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of Jehovah. In other words, God's anger is on the churches because they have set up their own kind of salvation plan, a do-it-yourself. They have not listen to the whole Bible. They are not, they are going, they are doing what they want to do, using the Bible as a, a, a pretext or as a, uh, a means to try to give them uh, the appearance of real authority. They can talk about what we believe is from the infallible Word of God, but they're not looking at the whole Bible. They're only looking at certain verses that they are focusing on. And it's because of what the Bible says. Or again, like we read in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation. That is, now, when you detect that things are going bad, then then you come out uh, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. But again, in Revelation 18, verse 4, it talks about coming out, or you have to get out of Babylon. You said when I left that church, you said that was for a reason. You said that God had um, commanded me to leave. You think he did that because he was upset at me or he was trying to help me by letting me go? He was trying to save me from that church. You think that he commanded me to leave? That's why? Well, you see, when you're saying that you're, you're, you're becoming more sinful or you sense sin in your life to a higher degree, uh, that is not a... Uh, you, 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 while you were in the church, you uh, you were the church was a, uh, a a means which you are trying to show through which we're trying to show that you are a child of God. You have elders and deacons that are spiritual oversight over you, and you don't want, and you don't want them to see sin in your life. So it caused you to mechanically or physically walk more what you felt was more faithful to the Word of God. Actually, of course, you were not at all faithful to the Word of God. Uh, You were simply trying to be faithful to what the church rules, ruled, or what they 
demanded. That's what, that is where you were trying to be faithful of. But when we become a child of God, we have an intense desire. I mean an intense desire to be faithful to anything and everything in the whole Bible. If we learn, uh, if we hear about a doctrine that we haven't heard about before and, and we check it out and it really comes from the Bible, well, okay, that's important to me. I want to be faithful to that doctrine because when we become saved, we have been given a brand new eternal soul, which is an integral part of our personality. And the Bible tells us that in that new soul, we will not sin. And so that makes an enormous impact upon our life. I believe because God was upset with me, you think? Or he just was trying to help me and, and deal with me on my own. That's why he caused me to leave. So how can I help myself now? Like, if he's coming next year, May 2011, yeah. how can I help myself when I'm struggling with this and I have nobody else? It's not safe to go back to the church, you say, but should I pray to him on my own and just study to read the Bible on my own? I think I'm not strong enough for that. I need help. I don't want to, you know, miss the rapture. I want to go up with him, but I'm struggling with this specific sin. Well, you know? just be, bear in mind, God knows all about you, uh, and God does is telling us, that he's still saving people, and that's what you desire, because until you become saved, you're headed right for Judgment Day. But we're living in a day when God assures us he is saving many people. How do we become saved? By becoming good? No, no. We have to wait upon God, and we cry out to him for mercy, and we cry out to him for mercy. Oh, Lord. I know I'm a sinner. I, I sense that, that I am a sinner. I find sin in my life, and I know that it's sin that is causing your wrath to be on me, and I deserve your wrath altogether. We don't pull any punches about it. We come clean that we understand that we're in deep trouble. And, oh, Lord, strengthen me as I try to turn away from that sin, and and as I... Uh, I plead with thee that maybe I too might become a child of God. I know I can't do anything to assure myself that I become a child of God. There's nothing I can do. It's all dependent upon your mercy and on your grace. And so I have to wait upon you. But, oh, Lord, I, I'm pleading and I'm begging and I'm imploring. Could it be that I too can become a child of God? And I, I, I find that sin... I, I want to turn away from sin That's a, uh, because I know that is not moving in a direction where I am really uh, being honest in my pleading with, with, with you for salvation. But now we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.